uh, or laptop and a mobile device. Um, as I said before, and I've, I've tried to emphasize throughout the class, that's something that is a huge consideration. Um, and it is increasingly becoming even more of a consideration. You really want to make sure that you do this and you do this right. Um, as a general rule, um, layouts and designs for a mobile device are going to be simpler than for a desktop device. Uh, for all the logical reasons, all right? Smaller screen, smaller areas to click on, different way that people navigate a mobile device versus a desktop device. But also for maybe some more subtle reasons, and that is generally speaking, if someone is accessing your site from a mobile device, they tend, their goals tend to be a lot more focused and a lot less open-ended. Um, Again, the, the example I gave is someone going through a college website. Um, if you're accessing it on a desktop, you might be spending more time investigating like what majors uh, they offer at the college, what courses they offer, and so on. Or generally speaking, if you're accessing a college's website from a mobile device, you're probably very focused looking for an answer to a specific question. So your goals are a little bit different as well. So for all these reasons, um, simpler rules uh, in the mobile world, simpler layout. Now we talked about briefly three strategies um, the last lecture of implementing mobile versus desktop. And I'd like to review these and talk about the ones that we're going to talk about and talk about the one that we're not going to talk about. Um, Option one is a one-size-fits-all. This is more feasible if you have a simpler, smaller website. You know, if you think of a website with a half dozen pages, again, a good example that I could think of would be like for a restaurant, all right? Restaurant websites are typically not that complicated, not that involved. You know, they might have a map, they might have um, a little bit of information about like what kind of foods they feature, a menu, and so on. But typically they're not going to have that extensive of a, um, of a um, site. Um, it's possible to have a one-size-fits-all website. All right. What are the guidelines um, that you're going to take with that? Again. You have a simpler layout. You're going to size things based on percentages and not absolute pixels. All right. Um, Now this isn't a hundred percent. You might put a margin in as, as an absolute number of pixels or padding as pixels or so on. But generally speaking, if you're defining the width of something, you're going to be using a percentage as opposed to an absolute number of pixels. Um, and this extends even to images. You can make images a percentage rather than an absolute number of pixels. You may take advantage of the min width and max width as well. So maybe you will use a percentage for some things, but you'll make a minimum width of a certain number of pixels. That's sort of a nice compromise between the two so you don't get too small. Um, of a column on a desktop when you when you resize it. All of these things taken together, especially these two things, um, oh, and the last thing is typically you're going to be using floating layouts. These things taken together form what is called responsive web design. And responsive web design is nothing more than um, your web page sort of conforming itself to the size of the container. So 
looking like two columns on a wide monitor, whereas looking as a single column um, on a smaller mobile device. That's a classic example of a responsive um, website. All right. We've covered pretty much all these things. It's just a matter of using them and using them effectively. The second is to have two CSS files, and actually you could have two or even more CSS files that apply in different situations. And this is the technique that we're going to spend most of the lecture on today. So I'm going to put this one on the back burner for a minute here while I wrap the other one up and then we'll come back to talk about this. This involves the use of what is called media queries. Media queries allow you to define rules that say under these circumstances this style sheet applies, under these other circumstances this style sheet applies. So that's what a media query is. All right. So you can define on a mobile device I want it to look this way, on a desktop device I want it to look this way. And you can actually apply different style sheets. So if you think about those exercises I had you do where you had to do two versions of the same page, where you had one style sheet and then you had the same page with a different style sheet. That's actually very relevant because you do that all the time with mobile sites and desktop sites. You can take and you can apply um, you can apply um, different style sheets and get a different look with the same HTML content. And that's a very valuable tool in your uh, tool set as a developer. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that one. Finally, um, there is actually having two separate sites. And that is where there is some code on the web server that serves as a traffic cop. And depending on where the request comes from, it directs the user either to a mobile version of the site or a desktop version. So there's two actual websites. It's like there's two different websites. And there's code on the web server that switches, that looks to see at the device that comes in, who is making the request, what sort of device, and depending on um, who you are and, and what device you're using, it either sends you to the mobile version of the site or the desktop version of the site. Remember we talked about, we drew the diagram of a client accessing the internet and sending a request to a web server. And we said that the client makes a request. That request includes like the name of the website or the name of the web page that you're trying to access. So it would include that I'm going to www.cnn.com or ESPN.com or whatever. But also included in that request is information about who is making the request. And when I say who, I mean, is it a Windows versus a Mac machine? Is it a mobile device versus a desktop? All right. Your location is included in there. All right. If you ever notice when you Google something, um, if you Google something like a store or a, a kind of restaurant, all right, your results are geared towards where you're located. So if I were to Google Italian restaurants, I'd get a list of Italian restaurants that are in this area, right? Does that mean that all the best Italian restaurants are in Lorain County? No. It's that the web server is smart enough to know where the request is coming from and tailor the results based on that. Well, the web server can do the same thing based on who is making the request in terms of is it a Windows machine, is it a Mac? Is it a mobile device? Is it a desktop? Sometimes you may even notice, 
for example, if you access a page to download some software, um, it seems to know if you're on Windows or a Mac because you're directed to the proper page. And it will say, you know, if, if you're downloading um, Google Chrome, for example, you know, and I'm doing it from a Mac, it will say download Google Chrome. And it will have already the highlighted the link for the Mac. So you can just click on it and download it instead of having to search through a list of things. So along with the web page that you're requesting, you send a lot of information through the internet to the server. And some of those, uh, some of that information includes um, what kind of device you're accessing it from. All right. Now, all these things can be mixed and matched, by the way. All right. So it's not a case of these are clear-cut separations. You can use these things. And there's other techniques that you can use as well that involve server-side scripting and client-side scripting to do device detection and, and all kinds of things. So the picture is a much more difficult than the picture I've painted here. All right, and much more involved. But for our purposes, we're, uh, the, the points I want to emphasize in this class are using these techniques, percentages and not absolute pixels, minimum and maximum width, and a floating layout, and having two CSS files that apply using the media queries. Those are going to be the solutions that we're going to stress. The other thing that comes into play is there being mobile applications, which are different than mobile websites. All right. What's the difference between a mobile website and a mobile application? What is the difference between a mobile website and a mobile application or an app? Okay. Okay. That's one huge difference. A mobile website is going to be viewed by a bunch of different devices. An app is specific to a certain device. So, for example, it, let's, let's take something innocent like the Weather Channel, all right? There you can access the Weather Channel's website, all right, through the browser. You can also probably download the Weather Channel app. But there's a different version of the app for iPhone versus Android, where there is not a different version of the mobile website for that, the mobile website. Um, uh, the website for, uh, is going to be accessed by a variety of people. It's just like Facebook, right? You could access, you could open up your web browser, you know, depending on what mobile device you have, and go to www.facebook.com and you can log in. All right? Um, or you can download the Facebook app. What's the advantages to each of those? What's the advantage of an app versus a mobile website and vice versa? An app may provide faster access. Why is that? Exactly. Um, you, you don't have to open up a browser and type in www.facebook.com. Typically, you just click an icon and boom, there you go, you're in Facebook. All right. So there's sort of the convenience and the simplicity aspect of it. What else? All right. Mobile websites, you don't have to worry about different versions. So anyone that has a web browser can access your website. Whereas it's possible to have um, a, an application that works on one platform and not on the other. Or from a developer's perspective, if you're developing uh, a mobile application, you have to worry about coming up with two versions of it. Whereas you don't have to, you know, you can come up with a single mobile website that will be uh, usable in a variety of platforms. Other advantages and disadvantages that you can think of. Well, a mobile application requires you to download something. All right, takes up space on your phone. 
all right? Um, that that's, could be a problem, right? Uh, a mobile application requires updating. Now, sometimes those are updated automatically, but still it requires updating, whereas a mobile website is automatically updated. Once the server is updated, the next person that accesses that page gets the updated version. Mobile applications, because they're written with a certain platform in mind, can take advantage of all the features that that platform can provide. So, for example, if it's heavily integrated with the camera and with the, uh, the microphone and, and so on, like, for example, Facebook, all right, um, you, can, you can introduce more features into an application because it's written for a specific platform and therefore it's easier to integrate all the features of that platform. All right. The downside, of course, is you have to develop a, a iPhone and a Android version of the application. So there's double the work. Now again, all these statements are very general statements. We could talk about any number of these for hours on end. All right. There is a class in mobile web development where we explore some more of the options that you can, that you can do. Um, and some of the advantages, really, of mobile websites. One of the big advantages of mobile websites is you can integrate the location um, into it a lot more precisely than you can um, on a desktop website. All right. At any rate, though, what I want to do now is I want to explore this option of having two or more CSS files that apply in different situations through the use of media queries. Now, I'm going to put this up and I'm going to put this web page up as a disclaimer. Uh, I am not claiming this is a great looking web page, all right? I'm just trying to demonstrate some things with this web page. So if you look at it, don't look and say, oh, that's ugly. Try, try to learn the lesson that we're trying to, to talk about as opposed to um, um, nitpicking the design. So let's go and let's download this. Now, notice I have two versions of this. I have one that's called Progressive Enhancement and Graceful Degradation. These are two styles that you can take when you're developing a mobile website. And we're going to start off talking about the Progressive Enhancement method because that is sort of the method that is preferred if you're starting and designing a new website from scratch. All right. In a nutshell, progressive enhancement is, is sort of, if you're doing something from the ground up, that would be the approach that you'd want to use. Graceful degradation would be if you were brought onto an existing project that already had a website and you just want to make the website more compatible with mobile devices. You'd use some of the techniques used in here. The idea is, is um, sort of uh, a difference in the direction that you take. With progressive enhancement, progressive enhancement is sometimes called mobile first. Whereas you design you start with the mobile version of the site, then you add stuff 
to come up with the desktop version. Graceful degradation is the opposite. You start with the desktop site and you take away stuff to end up with the mobile version. So if you're doing it from scratch, the better approach is to start with the mobile design. That way you're focusing on the essentials, you're focusing on the most important stuff, and then you can add stuff on, you can add the bells and whistles and the additional features on the desktop site. However, if you are brought in on a project where you already have a web page uh, or a website, um, you might use the um, graceful degradation where you take away things all right, to come up with um, the mobile version. Let's start looking at progressive enhancement. And I'm going to bring up this page. This is how the page looks on a desktop device. Oh. Notice there's three columns. There's a background. There's a picture. And there's navigation on the side. Now this page itself, this version itself is responsive. Notice things are based on percentages. So as I move and make the browser window smaller, everything gets smaller. The columns get narrower. The image gets smaller. At a certain point, the stuff wraps around and becomes one single column. Now, how do we view this on a mobile device? Well, we could test on our own mobile device if, if we had it, but as a developer you don't always have access to all different kinds of mobile devices, so you can use an emulator. And there's an emulator built into Google Chrome. Um, there also is the Opera mobile emulator, which is popular. To access the emulator, you can click on the little menu here under Developer Tools. And you can go in and you can set how you want to view this. So I could view this in a Galaxy SX, or S, S5 rather. And that's what the page looks like. Now again, note, this is identical HTML. We have not touched the HTML at all. That's the same HTML as this is. And we can even read my project, home, P1 through P4, the picture, and so on. But it looks a lot different. All right, let's take a look at the code to see how we accomplish that. And again, notice that the differences typically are simplifying it. We don't have the background. We actually don't have the image. The menu is oriented horizontally. And instead of three columns, we just have one column. So. We're going to forget about these lines for a minute here, 13 through 19. Those are lines that you can put in for browser compatibility. We'll talk about those at the end, um, either today or on Monday. But we're going to leave these out for now. These two lines are the important lines. All right. We actually have two style sheets. We have a base style sheet 
And then we have a style sheet for desktop devices. All right. So which one of these applies? Well, it's possible to have two style sheets that apply to the same page. All right. And in this case, the base style sheet applies for everyone. So everyone gets the base style sheet. Notice this, this link looks like the link that we've been doing since we've been doing style sheets. Link type equals text CSS, rel equals style sheet, href equals base CSS. This one kind of looks like it, but it has an extra bit on it. And this extra bit is called a media query. All right. What is a media query? Again, a media query says when this style sheet applies. And this style sheet applies only for a computer screen that is at least 601 pixels wide. All right. In other words, sort of to translate that into more intuitive language, this is going to apply for a computer screen and not a mobile screen. So we start out with a base. We start out with what everyone gets. And then we add in some things. But we don't add it in for everyone. We only add it in if they're on a computer screen that is at least 601 pixels wide. So let's look at the two style sheets in question here. The base and the desktop. Notice that there's some things that are in both. For example, body is in the base and body is in the desktop. Header is in the base and header is in, it's not in the desktop. Nav is in the base and nav is also in the desktop. So which one applies if it has two style rules? Well, if the style rules are for different things, then they both apply. So notice, for example, here, I have font family Helvetica Ariel Sans Serif. Yeah, I don't have a case of what I thought. Let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of the font family temporarily. All right. So, I have font family in the base for the body, but I do not have it in the body for the computer screen, for the desktop version. Since both style sheets apply, then everyone is going to get that font. So, the answer to which style sheet overrules if they don't talk about the same attributes, then both of them apply. If they do talk about the same attributes, for example, navigation with 30%, here it says navigation with 100%, then the second one applies. So if they don't, if they deal with different attributes, then both of them apply. If they both deal with the same attribute, then the one that's defined second overrules the one that's defined first. So, on a desktop device, both of these style sheet files apply. 
On the body tag, I've defined, I've defined the font of Helvetica, Ariel, and Sans Serif. I have not defined that on the second style sheet. So on a desktop device and on a mobile device, the fonts will be Helvetica, Ariel, Sans Serif. The nav I've defined on the base style sheet to be a width of 100%. On the desktop style sheet, I've defined the width to be 30%. So, on desktop machines, both of these style sheets apply, and the 30% overrules the 100%. So that's why if we look on the desktop device, the navigation has a width of 30%. Because they both apply, but the second one overrules. Now in the case of a mobile device, this style sheet applies and this one doesn't. Alright? Therefore, these are the rules that get applied in a mobile device. In a nutshell, with progressive enhancement, you define sort of your baseline, simplest style sheet for a mobile device in one style sheet file. Then you define in the second style sheet file what you want to overrule on a desktop machine. So I change the column widths. I put a background image on it. Now, here's a good question. Why do we have an image on this one and not on this one? Well, let's look at the style sheet rules. In the base, I say the section images display of none. Display of none means the image doesn't display. So that's why we don't have the image in the mobile version. However, in the desktop version, we say display inline, and once more, we make the width 100%. So that as I make the browser window bigger and smaller, the image takes up 100% of its container. Now, why does it stop getting smaller at that point? Well, I have a minimum width defined on the section. There are a couple other things to do. Let me make this a little bit smaller. This tag is important. This meta tag. This makes the display more readable on a mobile device, the viewport meta tag. If we get rid of that, then it makes it super big. But if we put that back in, then it's a reasonable size. So, that's progressive enhancement. We start with a simplest style sheet. So if I was developing this, I would not have this in at all when I was first developing it. I would develop my base style sheet and I would develop my page to look like, to look correct on a mobile device. I would then go in and put any differences that I wanted for a desktop machine in the second style sheet file, and I would put a media query on that style sheet so only desktop machines got this style. And this would be additions to the page, making the image visible and, and adding a background image and changing it from one column to three columns. Now, graceful degradation, we're going to look at this, it's going to look virtually identical, but we came at it from the opposite perspective.
Actually, it doesn't look identical. I must have made some changes to this. But this is on a desktop machine. This is on a mobile device. The difference is the direction that we go. In this one, we start out with the full style sheet, and we take away stuff in that second style sheet. Actually, this, this is not. This is, a, this is a much different example. I, I apologize. I didn't realize it was this much different. Well, really, the main thing I do in this case is I start out with the image showing, and then in the mobile version, I hide the image. All right. Same idea. It's just the direction that you're going in. In the case of a uh, um, progressive enhancement, you start out with the mobile version of the style sheet, then you add stuff in in the second style sheet. And in the case of the... Um, Graceful degradation, you start out with the full version and you take stuff away in the second style sheet. Now, you can use alternate style sheets for all kinds of different reasons. You can use other style sheets in addition to this. Uh, one thing that, that sometimes do is people give the option of skinning a site. In other words, making the site look the way that you want it to look. All right. And there's any number of different techniques that you can do for that. Um, you can have a whole bunch of different style sheet files and essentially allow the user to choose which one that they want to apply. All right. Or you can allow the users to mix and match and pick different properties. And then server-side scripting will put together a style sheet just for that person's uh, particular configuration. All of this stems from doing a good job in writing our HTML so that our HTML doesn't have anything that relates to the appearance of the page in it. And we use CSS just for the layout and for the appearance. All right. I did mention I wanted to look at these two things. I think I alluded to them, and they are in the textbook. Notice that there are two other snippets of code in here. There is an additional style sheet that's called ff.css. Oh. There is a third style sheet that's called ff.css. And then finally, there's this little snippet of code. So we'll talk about each of these. Each of these lines of code deal with old browser compatibility. The way that it works is people are writing browsers at the same time as the W3C is developing specifications for HTML. So it's not as though the W3C announces one day, here is the specification for HTML5, and the browser makers go off and make browsers that do HTML5. The people that develop the specification, the W3C, prepare drafts and say, this is what we're planning on doing with HTML5. And then periodically they update those drafts. And browser makers try to stay caught, caught up with that. However, they don't always stay exactly caught up. All right? And old browsers, browsers that never, that were written before HTML5 was created, won't know what to do with HTML5 tags. Right? Because they weren't planning on having to handle a header and a footer and a nav. All right? So these are little things that you can put in your code to allow old browsers that were not written to accommodate HTML5 to at least somewhat accommodate HTML5. This first one is simply a little CSS file, and it's pretty simple. All it tells the browser to do is to treat all of these 
new HTML5s as block tags. Because really, basically, that's all they are. In the old days, in HTML4, you didn't have a header and a footer and a section and an article and an aside. What did you have? You had a div. And the div was used for everything. This essentially just tells the browser, treat all of these new tags as block tags, because that's what they are. All right. Unfortunately, you can't do that in Internet Explorer. So someone wrote what's called an HTML5 shiv, which is like a little, you know, this is, this is, this is like the programmer's equivalent to like duct taping something in place, all right? In other words, this isn't a good solution, but it works, right? So someone wrote a little piece of JavaScript that essentially teaches the browser and by the browser, I mean specifically old versions of Internet Explorer. It teaches old versions of Internet Explorer of how to handle HTML5 tags. All right? So this does the same thing as this, except this works on old versions of Internet Explorer, and this works on old versions of Firefox. So it's probably a good idea to put these in and I would actually move them to the top of my head section so that my style sheets took precedence over them. All right. But these are a good idea to have for any page that you're going to use. Yes? OK, sure. And you, can also, you can also download this, too. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this will be available as well. So this is an additional thing that you can do um, to um, ensure old browser compatibility. Let me see what version of Internet Explorer we have. Wait a minute, that's Edge. We have Internet Explorer. We have Internet Explorer 11. So this deals with Internet Explorer 9 and earlier, I believe. All right? Because at a certain point, HTML5 was incorporated in Internet Explorer, and you no longer need this. And that's effectively what this line says. If it's earlier than 9, so 8 and earlier, it will handle this. Yes? How do you add comments in HTML and CSS? In HTML, you add comments this way. So you start with a less than sign, exclamation point, dash, dash. You then have your comment for however many lines that it takes. And then you end with this. In other words, and this is really goofy. I'm not, I'm not the person that made this up, so don't blame me. This is actually an HTML comment. But Internet Explorer interprets it as a command because Internet Explorer is goofy, all right? But Firefox and any other browsers will simply see that as a comment. That's how this doesn't get in the way for Firefox or Internet Explorer. So that's how you do comments in um, HTML. In CSS, you simply put comments like you do in many languages with the slash slash.
Actually, let me verify that. Well, I'm, I, I kind of lied. You do. Like that. Uh, typically they do in most languages. I'm not sure if they do in CSS or not. Yeah, you see, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's considered a comment or not. Yeah, it do, doesn't look like it, but that could just be a quirk of um, Notepad++. Um, I haters. CSS is missing the line comment syntax. So you cannot do the slash slash. All of them have to be block comments. Okay. All right. And someone has a note to the haters out there that explains that. All right. Um, I have to review my notes to see what's next. I, I think I know what's next, but I have to review my notes. But let me tell you, from here on in for the rest of the semester, all right, getting your project done is like job one. All right, so your design is due, I don't know when, but pretty soon. Pardon me? Yeah, like in probably two weeks or so, week and a half, something like that. So we will spend a little bit of time next week I will ask for any questions that you have concerning it, and please feel free to post to the discussion forum, send me an email if you have questions about it, or bring them up in class. Because really, you could probably do your project with everything that we've talked about up to this point. And we're going to cover some additional stuff to be sure. You know, you're, you're not allowed just to go home after today's class, all right? But uh, you could probably do 80 to 100% of your project with just the material that we've covered up to this point. So you should have enough information to make a good dent in your project already. So don't forget about it, don't leave it to the last minute, and we'll spend some time discussing it. And if you do have questions, please bring them to class. There's an old, and I said this probably the first day of class, there's an old teacher saying that if you have a question, there's a good chance that other people in the class have the question too. So please bring your questions to class. All right, we'll see you up in lab.